Now last week we went through the first 14 verses of this chapter. Um, if you remember the, the Corinthians had written to Paul, remember it said in verse number 1, Now concerning things Rob, you wrote unto me. So the Corinthians had written to Paul, asking him a bunch of questions. And that's actually a good thing to do, if you think about it. I mean, if you don't know something, or if you wonder about something, it's, it's a good idea to ask questions. Because, I mean, who knows everything? Put your hand up if you know everything. No, my hand's just up by way of example. I don't know everything. And the fact is, no one knows everything. And so, guess what? A good idea is to ask questions, and so that you can learn from people. And if you're going to ask a question, it's also a good idea to ask someone who is in a position to know. Who's, and you, know, you don't just want to ra- ask random people. Because if you ask random people, you're going to get some pretty random answers. Don't need to turn there, but in Proverbs 13, 20, it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. In other words, if you want to be wise, you need to be around people who are wise. And then it says in Proverbs 24, 6, that in the multitude of counsellors, there are safety. So when you're asking a multitude of counsellors, and obviously those counsellors you're asking, they, you want them to be wise people. But of course, the, the, sort of the other side of the coin, if you like, it says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. In other words, someone who's foolish, they think they're right all the time. Everything I'm doing, it's all right. There's no problem what I'm doing. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. In other words, the person who listens to counsel. They listen and they learn, because guess what? You can listen from, to someone who maybe agrees with you in some areas, they disagree in some areas, and you can listen, you can listen to their arguments, you can see if it makes sense, you can work through, you can learn something, and it can modify what you believe. It can modify your thinking, and that can be a good thing. You know, because, you know, I think I've mentioned this before, there was a guy, he doesn't work in a department anymore, but he used to work in a department, and this guy, he had this sign on his door, and on his door was this sort of sign that said, to be less wrong, and that was kind of like his goal. In other words, he, he knew that he didn't know everything, he knew there was a lot to learn, and he wanted to just learn something, to be less wrong than he was now. You know, it's, it's a good sort of attitude to have. Now, here's the thing. Paul was a good person, to be listening to. Paul was a good person to be listened to. He was an apostle. He was chosen by God himself. Remember, Jesus met him on the, on the road to Emmaus. You know? You know, he knocked him off his horse and blinded him. And he, Jesus was the one who appointed him to be an apostle. He was a, he was a missionary. He was a church planter. When you think about Paul being on a missionary, what does it mean for someone to be a missionary? If someone's a missionary, it means they've got a mission. They are on a mission. He had a purpose. He had a direction in his life. You know, Philippians, he writes about this in Philippians chapter number 3. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Because Paul, he had a lot of things behind him. He had a lot of bad things behind him. He says, look, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was a man on a mission. He was a man on a mission. He had something that he was working towards. Well, the question you might ask is, well, what's my mission in life? What is my mission in life? Paul's mission was to fulfill the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission, we often mention it in, in uh, Matthew chapter number 28. You know, it said, Jesus said, All power is given unto me on heaven and earth. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's the first part. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this is in teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lie with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So it's those three parts, you know. Go on teaching all nations. That's getting people saved, preaching the gospel. Then, baptizing them. And then the third thing is teaching them everything else. That's what goes on, teaching them all the other things that are in the Bible. And that's what we see, that's what the Apostle Paul was focused on. He was particularly, I would say, focused on parts one and parts three. He was very much concerned with people getting saved, and he was very much concerned with teaching people like other things in the Bible. He didn't focus on baptism massively, you know? I mean, because, in fact, we've, earlier in the book we've seen, he only baptised a few people. He's like, baptised you know, Stephanus' household and Crispus and, you know, a few, few other people. But it wasn't a big thing. He wasn't really into, into baptism massively. And it's not that he was neglecting, you know, one third of the Great Commission. It's not that he was neglecting that. I mean, basically... He, he, he did baptise people, but he often, I think what happened is he let other people do the baptisms. You know, he was setting up churches in various places, and he probably got the, the people that were set up in those churches to do the baptism. Because one of the things Paul was worried about, one of the things he was concerned about, that we've already seen, he didn't want people to become followers of Paul. He was very concerned about that. You know, because in the Corinthians, remember? I follow Paul, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Apollos. He was worried about these divisions, where people would say, I'm going to... They would lift him up, and they would, they, they would follow him, you know? And, and obviously, obviously, Paul did want people to follow him. In fact, in this very book, he actually says, follow me. 
You know, he says, be ye followers of me. He did want people to follow him, but that was because he was following God, because he was following Christ. But he was concerned about people wanting to be attached to his name. And saying, you know, I'm a, I, I, I'm, in fact, aren't there people? I think there are. I'm pretty sure, I think there's Baptists that are they're like, they're, they're like Pauline Baptists or something crazy like that. In other words, they believe that the, the letters of Paul, that's what it's all about. Don't worry about the stuff in the Gospels. No, that's old. You know how, this, you know how there are people who think, like the Old Testament, that, that, was, that was them, and we don't need to worry about anything that says in the Old Testament, and we're just New Testament believers. I've heard pastors say that. We're New Testament believers, and that's true. We are in the New Testament. But the New Testament says in 1 Timothy, no, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible says all Scripture. Not just the New Testament, not just the letters of Paul, you know, it's, it's the whole thing. Now there are changes, and we're not going off into that whole topic today, there are changes in the law, and there are some things that don't apply, you know, don't do the dietary laws and all that sort of stuff. But here's the thing, Paul, he didn't want people to be, you know, a Paulite, a Pauline Baptist, you know. He was, he was, he was weary of becoming too important in people's eyes, and... and, and we should be aware of that, you know, both as a, as a follower and also as a leader. You know, when you're leading people, you, don't, you need to be careful, not wanting people to stick closely. Don't, you want, don't want people to believe something just because you believe it, you know? That's all. I don't want you guys to believe, well, look, Ian says it, so therefore it's true. No, that's wrong. It should be because the Bible says it, and you believe it, and you've studied it out of the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you have a doctrine that you hold to and you cling to, you should be able to show it out of the Bible. And if you can't show it out of the Bible, it means, guess what? You got it from somewhere else. You got it from somewhere else. Because if you can't show it in the Bible, it's something you've picked up. You know? You've picked it up from somewhere else. And so you're clinging to a doctrine that maybe it's biblical. You know, maybe the person who showed it to you was good and it's right. But maybe it's not. That's why you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. Now, we also saw in this last chapter, in the first part of the chapter, we saw, obviously, one of the big things that started off as good for man not to touch a woman, talked about the whole avoiding fornication, and what's the way to avoid fornication? Get married. Get married. Okay, so then you can touch a woman without it being any sort of issues. And Paul, in this chapter, he gives, he gives in the start, he gives advice to single people, to married people, you know, he warns against getting divorced, just like Jesus did. Remember, Jesus warned about being divorced. Actually, turn there, look at Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 7. But in Matthew chapter number 19, we're going to come back a couple of times tonight, but Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 5, Matthew 19, verse number 5, Jesus said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. That means join to his wife. And they twain, they two, shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You see, Paul warns about being divorced. Jesus warned about separating. He says, no, let not man put asunder what God has joined together. And then we finished up last week with Paul emphasizing that even if your husband or your wife is an unbeliever, that doesn't give you grounds for leaving them. You know, doing so could have a really bad effect on the children. We looked a little bit at that. So let's, let's pick up where we left off. We got up to verse number 14, so let's jump into verse number 15. Verse number 15. It says, so maybe just read the verse, actually read, read verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. So if your unbelieving spouse leaves, you aren't in bondage. To have, you don't have to keep chasing them and chasing after them. We, I talked a little bit about that, but the whole you know, you get covenant keepers. And these people, where they, they think they're still married to someone. Even when their husband or their wife, they leave them, they get divorced, they marry someone else. And it's, no, I'm still believing God. I'm this, I'm this covenant keeper. That's what it says. Look, if they, if, they, if they leave, if they depart, you're not under bondage. Okay, in such a case. But God hath called us to peace. Look at verse number 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Because obviously the great desire would be, as if you were married to an unbelieving spouse, the great desire would be that they would get saved. Wouldn't it? You'd want them to get saved. It would be great if your unbelieving spouse got saved. But here's the thing, you don't know if that's going to happen. You don't know if that's going to happen. And that's one of the reasons why, and I'll mention it a bit later in this chapter, when you get married, get married to a believer. Get married to believe it. Because some people say, I'm going to marry this person and then they'll get saved after. 
That's happened to a lot of people. That's happened to a lot of people. You know, I, mean, I know someone who, who they got married to someone, and well, this person they, they were they were sort of friends with someone, and this person they um, they were saved, but the other person wasn't saved. Well, they shouldn't really have been that close to that person when they 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 were saved, and the other person wasn't. But then they prayed and said, "Look, God, if this is the person you want, then they need you know they need to get saved." And then lo and behold, they supposedly got saved. But whether that really happened, I mean, they acted in some really bizarre ways, and it seemed like maybe it was just a, just a pretense. You know, so don't get involved with someone unless you know that they are saved. And not only that they're saved, you want it to be someone who loves God. Someone who loves God. Because that's someone who actually wants to serve God with their life. Okay? Because the Bible warns about, it says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In other words, a believer and an unbeliever, it's not a good idea for them to be married. But even if... If, even if you were both believers, if, one of you, if you want to serve God and your spouse doesn't, that's going to lead to conflict. It's like you know, a couple of horses and they're going in different directions, they're pulling it. It's like, it's not going to work. That's what it talks about being unequally yoked. But notice also it says in this verse, How knowest, what knowest thou, wife, whether thou, sh- whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Notice it says, thou shalt save. You see, the Bible does teach that we save people. We save people. Okay, now, just so you understand, the Saviour, there's only one Saviour. Jesus Christ is the Saviour. He is the Saviour. But we do save people. And sometimes people get upset when they hear someone say that. But it's what the Bible teaches. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 19. It says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Notice what Paul's saying. He wanted to save people. He wanted to save people. Um, it talks about it in, in um, the book of Jude, I think it is. In Jude, it's, there's only one chapter, it says, um, um, and some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. The Bible says that we save people. Look at Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 14. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 14. Romans chapter number 11, verse number 14. He says, um, or maybe start at verse number 13. It says, But I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, he's talking about his fellow Israelites, people from the same nation as him, and might save some of them. You see, that was Paul's desire. He wanted to see people saved, and he realized that he wanted to save them. Look back at chapter number, chapter number 10. Chapter number 10, verse 1, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He says, For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God. They are zealous for God. You see, there's a lot of people who are zealous for God. You'll meet people who are very religious. Very religious. But does that mean they're saved? I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You see, the problem is they don't actually know the Bible. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going out to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, the person who's unsaved, the person who's ignorant of God's righteousness, that God is the only one who's righteous, and we're not. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. But what are they doing? They're going about to establish their own righteousness. That's a good sign to see if someone's saved or not. Are they going about trying to justify themselves? Why would you get to heaven? Oh, because I, I do this, I do that, I do this. That's a sign. He says, look, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Look down at verse number, um, uh, verse number 13. Very famous verse. It says, for, look, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it says, how then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see, we have a part to play in people's salvation. What do people have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. But how are they going to call on someone in whom they haven't believed? How are they going to believe in someone of whom they haven't heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone tells them without a preacher? There's not talking about someone behind a pulpit. There's talking about someone, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
And that's true as well, because the average person is not going to go and preach the gospel unless they're in a church where they're hearing, go and preach the gospel, go and preach the gospel. For the average church, that's not the case. We've got it here written, up here, look, pray there for the Lord the harvest, you will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's to remind us, the harvest is plenteous, the laborers are few. We need to be, each one of us, praying to God that he would send laborers into his harvest. And if you're there saying, Lord, please send a laborer. Lord, please send a laborer. Lord, please send a laborer. Now, I don't believe God's going to talk to an audible voice, but you might hear in the back of your mind God saying, hmm, laborer, why don't you labor? Yeah. You know, you're praying for God to send laborers. Why don't you go? Because isn't that what I said to you to do? He says, look, how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Guess what? It'll improve your, you know, the way your feet look. You know, you have better looking feet. How beautiful. Anyone ever called your feet beautiful? It says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad, bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I say, Lord, who hath believed our report? That's the problem. That's how people don't obey the gospel, because they don't believe. They don't believe the message. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's why people need preachers to go and speak to them. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's what they need to hear. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, of his own will begat us with the word of truth. Is that the right one? No, I think that's James. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 must be being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Look, there's a great example of this in Acts chapter number 10. Look at Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 1. Everyone familiar with Cornelius? Remember Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion? Acts chapter number 1, sorry, Acts chapter 10, excuse me, verse number 1. Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 1. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man. Notice this about this. Remember the Jews? Now this guy's not a Jew, but this guy is devout. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Look at this. He's devout. He fears God. So does his whole family. He gives, you know, he gives lots of money to the to poor people. He prays to God always. It sounds like he, he might be doing better than some of us. Doesn't it sound like he's doing better than some of us? And he saw in a vision, even about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. So notice, this guy, as well as all those other things, he's actually praying. God's hearing his prayer and he's sending an angel in answer to his prayer. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. But look what he says. He says, And now send me to Joppa. And call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So he says, look, you need to go and send to get this guy, Peter, and he's going to tell you some things. He's going to tell you some things. We won't bother reading through the chapter, but Peter's there and he's, he's, he's off. He's, you know, he's waiting for them to make lunch and he goes up, goes up and, has a, and has a, he's hungry and he has a sleep. And if you go to sleep when you're hungry, you might dream about food. And that seems to be what Peter was doing. And there's the sheet got, got let down from heaven and there's all these creatures in there, all sorts of animals. And a voice says, Peter, rise, slay and eat. And he's like, well, guess what? Some of those animals, they were unclean animals. Because, you know, remember, remember the, the, the Jewish laws about what you're supposed to eat and what you're not. But guess what? This is the New Testament. And the New Testament... You know, every creature of God is good. Nothing to be refused if we receive a thanksgiving. But that, the vision was given to him specifically. Say, look, guess what? The Jews think of the Gentiles as being unclean. But look, I want you to go and give the message to them. And that's what we see later in the chapter. Look at verse number 24. So Peter goes in, in obedience to the vision. And in verse number 24, it says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So notice, Cornelius, although he's very devout, but you can see his, his, his religious devotion is, is askew. Like he's falling down worshipping a man. It's kind of like, like the Catholics do that today. They worship down, they fall down at the Pope's feet and kiss his toe and stuff like that. And if he, and if he don't they say that Peter was the first Pope? They say Peter was the first Pope. Well, what about, why doesn't the Pope do what Peter did? Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. That's what the Pope should say, don't kiss my toe, stand up, I'm just a man. In fact, I'm a deviant man, but anyway. And as he, as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said, said unto them, you know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. 
Therefore came I unto you without gain, saying, As soon as I was sent for, I ask therefore for what intent you have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call her the Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent unto thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So he's saying, look, we're here and we're ready. We're ready to hear. What's the message that God has got for you to give to us? What is that message? Look down at verse number 38. And he says, look, this is the message Paul said to him. That well, verse 37, that word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing <clears throat> all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he, that's Jesus, which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness, that, who, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So what did Peter do? He preached the gospel. He talked about Jesus, his death, burial, his resurrection, and that salvation is in him alone. That's the message. That's the message that was given to him. And if you look in the next chapter, chapter number 11, and verse number 13, after they get saved, you know, they, they get baptized with the Holy Ghost, they speak in tongues, all sorts of these things happen. In chapter number 11, and verse number 13, Peter then goes back and reports back to the Jews what happened. To report back to church, excuse me, what happened. And look what he says in verse number 13. He says, And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words. Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So how do they get saved? By words. How do they, they get saved by words? What, how does that save them? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But of course, those words need to be delivered to them. That's why Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel every preacher. You know, let's get back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. But look, the Bible says, look, we save people. Now, it's not that we're the saviour. We didn't die for anyone, but we've got a message. You know, it's like, you know, someone's drowning. And look, we've got, we've got the means. Let's chuck that in. Let's chuck the life thing in. The preserver. That's exactly what it is. Look at verse number 17. I might speed up. It says, But God, as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Now doesn't it seem a bit strange? We've gone back to 1 Corinthians 7. You might think, are we back in the same chapter? Because what was all the stuff we're talking about before? You know, married and unmarried and virgins and fornication and all, and all of a sudden it's just like all this other stuff. What's being talked about here? It seems like the whole topic is no longer marriage. But in a minute, he's actually still talking about the same thing. You see, when he talks about abiding or remaining, that's referring to you know, staying you know, wherever you are, being content. Being content in whatever state you are. He says, look, guess what? Were you circumcised before? That's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, were you uncircumcised? There's no need to get circumcised. And we understand that, you know, that's nothing to do with salvation, all that sort of stuff. But look, he says, look, were you a servant? You know, did you have a master? Were you like lowly? Don't worry about it. You know, were you free? Hey, that's fine. You can use that, those advantages you've got. It doesn't, whatever state you're in, there be content, according to the Bible. We should, be, we should be content in whatever state we are. And see, he's then going to take and apply that to being married or being single. To being married or being single. You don't need to turn there, but it says in Philippians chapter number 4, Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 11, it says, Not that I speak in respect of want, 
So I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Whatever state you're in. Whether you're a servant, whether you're, whether you're free, whatever state you're in, he says, be content in that state. He says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now have a look and see what he says. So having said that, be content. Whatever state you're in, now look at verse number 25. Verse number 25, it says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So when it comes to getting married or not, there is no commandment from God. So what does that mean? You're not sinning if you don't get married. You're not sinning if you don't get married. And you're not sinning if you do get married. Okay, it's your choice. It's completely your choice. It's not a commandment from God. Now, Paul is going to give his opinion. And his opinion is profitable. Because guess what? This is scripture. And we know all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Okay, Paul's going to give his opinion. Look at verse number 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it's good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So, because of the present situation that they are in, Paul says it's good not to change that state. He says, look, are they bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loose. Are they loose to a wife? Seek not a wife. Now, it's pretty obvious why he would say, you know, seek not a wife, because if there's some current distress, it's probably not a good time to be getting married if they're in some big distress or whatever. But what about the first half of the verse? Are they bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Why would he say that? Why would he say seek not to be loose? Because it's possible to be loosed from your wife or husband in certain situations. Otherwise, why would he say it? You know, it's like he's saying, don't, you know, don't, don't murder. <laughs> you know, because the Bible always clearly spe- specifies that. But now there are some who would say, look, there is never a situation where you can be loosed from your wife or you can be loosed from your husband. Some people would say that. Turn back, if you were to um, uh, Matthew chapter number 19. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 7. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Because the Bible does teach that there are certain situations when it is possible to be loosed from your wife or from your husband. In Matthew chapter number 19. Look back at verse number... <clears throat> I'll just start in verse 1. It says, It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they're saying, look, can you just get divorced for any reason? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? What therefore no, wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh? What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder? So they're saying, Can we get just divorced for any old reason? And he says, Look, don't separate what God has joined. Pretty straightforward. But it doesn't stop there. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put away? He says, well, hang on a second. How come Moses said you could write this bill of divorcement? How come that could happen? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. He said, look, Moses made this allowance. Why? Because of your hard-heartedness. In other words, it still would be better not to. It would still be better not to divorce your wife, it would be better not to divorce your husband, but God, you know, when he gave the Lord to Moses, he made this allowance. And he says, look, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So what's the, what's the exception? For fornication. Now, does that mean if your husband or your wife commits fornication, you must put them away? No, Jesus said, look, if your heart's hard, you know, if you can't forgive, then that's what might happen. Okay? But that's the exception for fornication. And marrying up, because otherwise, if, if, you put, if you divorce them for some other reason, and you marry someone, what you're doing by that is committing adultery. And if you marry that person in that situation, you can commit adultery. And his disciples say to him, if the case be so of the man with his wife, it's not good to bear. They say, well, look, well, if we can't just divorce our wives for any, you know, whatever reason, it's not good to marry. And he said unto them, all men cannot receive the saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born of their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there are the eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, 
let him receive it. He said, guess what, not everyone's going to be able to receive this staying single. Now, there are some people who are born that way. There are some people who, you know, people have various you know, birth defects and, and, and it affects them in various ways. But like he says, there's some that were born that way and there are some people who've been made eunuchs of men. That's what they would do. They would, you know, they'd take people, they'd castrate them and stuff like that. And then there are people who've made themselves like figuratively eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And the apostle Paul would fit into this situation. He's someone, you know, who was, in that, he didn't have a wife. He was one of the few who didn't have a wife. Most of them did. Most of them had families. And then he says, look, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. In other words, some people can go down that path. But for most people, that's not really the case. Okay, and so we've gone through this before, and I don't really sort of really want to major on it. I think everyone's probably pretty familiar with it. The whole point about fornication. There are different views of fornication. Okay? Um, there are people who have the view that fornication is something that can only happen during the engagement period before someone comes together. They say fornication, if anything happens in marriage, it's no longer fornication, it's adultery. And we've gone through that before. You know, it's plenty of scriptures. We've seen in, in 1 Corinthians 5. Someone has his father's wife and it's called fornication. We've seen in Revelation chapter 2. You know, Jezebel, you know, she's, she's committing fornication and adultery in the same breath. Okay? Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. We won't spend too long there. But here's the thing. Let's get back to um, chapter number 7. Chapter number 7, verse number, verse number 28. But look, he's saying, look, art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. It's obvious that there could be a legitimate reason for you to get loose from your wife. Otherwise, why would he say it? Obviously, there could be a reason to get, a, to get married. But he's saying, look, for the present distress, best not to change the situation that you're in. Look at verse number 28. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. So, clearly, it's not a sin to get married. And obviously, you know, the, the whole intimacy within marriage, that's not sinful either, as some people have taught. I think, I think possibly in Catholicism, there's a bit of that sort of thing, that, that's some sort of, some sort of sinful thing. That's why it's promoted, this idea that to be a, a priest, to be a celibate priest, that's somehow some higher level. And it's not. It's not. Now, some people have that gift. That's fine to go down that path. But for most people, that's, that's, that's not the way that it is. Look at verse number 29. He says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world, world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. He says, look, we don't, there, was obviously, there was some sort of trouble that the Corinthians were going through. We don't know what was going on. But he says, for this present distress, it's good not to get married. Period. We don't know what sort of trouble it was they were going through. But it seems like Paul, he's not recommending lots of things. Not grieving, not, not, no, not owning things or, or whatever. Whatever's going on, I, I couldn't tell you what it is. You know, we don't necessarily know all the historical background. But he says, look, it's not, you know, it's because of this current situation. There are normal things that you could do, like getting married, and it says it's probably not a good idea. Verse number 32, he says, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. You see, Paul doesn't want them to be filled with care. He doesn't want them to be filled with care. Think about um, oh, Philippians chapter number 4. Look at Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. He says, look, be careful for nothing. Don't be filled with care. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How are you going to be not worried? How are you not going to be anxious? How are you not going to be filled with care? Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So that's the way to having peace. That's the way to being not filled with care, not being anxious. Thinking on these right things. And also doing the things. The things that he's taught, do those things. And the very next verse says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Remember, so we saw back before, you know, if you rejoice, no, don't rejoice. Don't do this, don't do that. But look, there is a time for rejoicing. There is a time for weeping. There is a time for getting married, even though in this particular situation, Paul didn't want them to be filled with care. Um, 
And not only that, if you look back in chapter number 7, 1 Corinthians 7, he says, um, verse 32, he says, I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. You see, there are certain advantages to being single. When you're single, there are certain advantages. There are less distractions. There are less cares that can hinder you from serving the Lord. That's just a fact. When you are, you know, when you're single, you have got there are things that are not going to distract you as much. But in contrast, if you look at the next verse, but he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. You see, when someone is married, they've got a lot of cares. They've got a lot of concerns that unmarried people don't have. You know, I mean, and you could look, obviously when people get married, they tend to have children, you know, and when you have children, you know, guess what? If you don't have children, you don't really understand what parents go through. You know, I remember the first time when we had, I mean, we, our first child we got, we adopted and we was, you know, seven or thereabouts. And so didn't sort of go through that sort of baby phase, but when we've had our first, you know, child born, it's like, I remember, because I was studying at the time, I remember going to, going to, to Varsity and, and, um, and I remember just looking at some of those lecturers, you know, who some of them had children. In fact, one of them was like a, there was a guy who was young in the, in the year behind me. And um, I remember thinking, wow, he's had these children. And they, they didn't warn me. They didn't warn me what it's like, you know, like to wake up every night. So this crying baby wake you up. It's like, no one warned me. You know, these things you got. And, I, and, I couldn't, and these people go to work and they function. Just, I was thinking, how do you do that? You know, and honestly, my marks went down a bit when after we had after we had children. They really did. Why? Because guess what? You can't just suddenly focus on what you were focusing on before. You can't just be focused on that. But when you're single, you've got all this time. And obviously, the application here is you can use it for serving God. You know, you know the young single guy. He's he he can go and he can do things that the married person can't do. You know, he can do a lot of soul winning. He can do a lot of so on. And, and sometimes young guys, they can have this attitude. Well, they can, sometimes it's good that they do it. But sometimes they'll do it and then they'll, they'll sort of look down on other people. Like, well, hey, you know, you guys should be soul winning like I am. You know, you need to get out and do... And it's like, yeah, because you've got all this time. You've got this freedom. You can do things that other people can't do. And that might be just for that particular time in your life. Just a particular time in your life. But that, that's exactly what it's like, you know? Look at verse number, verse number 34. He says, look, there is difference also between a, vo- a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be both holy in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Notice that it says there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. Obviously, you should be married or be a virgin, according to the Bible. And, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of demands that are put on a married person that aren't put on an unmarried person. You know? Now, obviously there's benefits as well. There's lots of benefits, but this chapter is particularly focusing on the benefits of being single rather than married. That's why I went over. Paul is saying, look, because this is a chapter, there are many people who are single, it's like, it's okay to be single. You can be single all the way through. You don't have to get married. Paul didn't, and that's absolutely fine. And that's, that's the focus of this chapter. Look at verse number, um, verse number 35. And this I speak, so, and this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So notice, Paul's not trying to lay unnecessary burdens on people, but he does want people to be able to serve the Lord to the best of their ability. You know? When you're single, you might be able to do a lot more soul winning than someone who's got a family. That's just a fact. You might be able to spend a lot more time studying the Bible and preparing sermons, you know? But obviously, there are, you know, there, these are advantages that you have when you're single. But there are disadvantages as well. You know, there are there's advantages and there are disadvantages, okay? And as I said, that's not what's focused on particularly in this chapter. Verse number 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin... If she pass the flower of her age and needs her require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. You see, if you feel like it is a struggle to remain single and stay a virgin, then you should get married. That's what the Bible saying. You should get married. Now, obviously, the person you marry should be, should be old enough. That's what it talks about there. If she passed the, the, flower, the flower of her age, um, you know, I mean, there are religions, Islam, I suppose, is the one that comes to mind, 
where marrying children is fine. Marrying children is fine, according to Islam. Why? Because, you know, that's what's promoted in Islam. It was practiced by Muhammad. You know, Muhammad did it. Muhammad married Aisha, I think it was when she was seven, and um, the marriage was consummated when she was nine. That's what it was. Okay, well, guess what? That doesn't line up with what the Bible says, because she's got to pass the flower of her age. Okay, and we won't bother looking there, but if you look in Leviticus chapter number 15, that's, ref- that's referring to, you know, when someone's reached maturity. That's what that's talking about. If you look in Leviticus 15, it talks about the flowers. Now, actually, interesting enough, today, sometimes, I mean, people can actually, both boys and girls, can actually mature quicker than they used to. There's a lot of sort of environment, environmental factors which can play a part on it. You know, with the stuff that people, even, some, even stuff that people watch on the television. The stuff that people watch, you know, not to mention the sort of chemicals and stuff that's in the food and all that sort of stuff, which can cause people to, they reach puberty at a younger age than they used to. You know, and I think probably the, the original way is probably better. Oh yeah, I, you know, it's, I, it's, it's, like, I stopped yeah. growing ever since I was like in middle school or something like that. You know, and but but that's the thing. There is, there is a difference. There is. A, I mean, obviously, people can mature at different rates, but just in general, people are actually reaching, you know, sexual maturity younger. Why? Because there's all this sexual stimulation out there in the world. You know, that's not normal. It's not. It's not. A, it's and, and, it's and, and it's and it's not a good thing. Yeah, there there is stuff to do with what you what what with what you're eating as well. Okay, um, verse number thirty seven. He says, look, nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power of his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. You said, look, if you are if you're able to remain unmarried without falling into sin, hey, you do well. You're doing good. That's a good thing. Verse 38. Um, so then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Once again, Paul expresses, look, his preference is for staying single. But as we've already seen this chapter, look, and the rest of the Bible, staying single is not for everyone. And obviously you've got, you know, talks to do with giving in marriage, and obviously, you know, you had the whole, you know, we probably still think about today, asking for the father to be allowed. There were things that, that fathers were allowed to do in the Bible. For example, if a, 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 a woman was living in her dad's house, and if she made a vow to vow to the Lord, if her dad heard it, he could disannul that vow. He could say, no, it doesn't stand. He had that authority over her. You know, if someone comes say, I want to marry your daughter, he can say, yes or no. You know, and, and, and that's not the sort of society that we live in today, but it's probably a good idea. If you think of getting married, it's a good idea to say, check with your dad. Check with your dad, because you might think this boy is really nice, but your dad's probably going to have a better idea, because he's got a few more years under his belt, he's got a bit more experience. Because you might like someone, but when you're in that infatuation, you know, it can kind of blind your eyes a bit to what that person's really like. Um, verse number 39 the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth but if her husband be dead she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord and it's interesting this is a verse that's often used by people who say that you can never get divorced for any reason there are people who say that you can never ever get divorced for any reason another verse that's used I think is Romans chapter number 7 keep your finger there and look in Romans chapter number 7 verse number 1 Romans 7 verse 1 says Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And some people use those two verses and say, look, you can never get divorced for any reason. But we've already seen that doesn't line up with Scripture. Because Jesus said, except to be for fornication. You know, Moses wrote it, Jesus confirmed it. You know, in some cases you could write a bill of divorce and get remarried. Not in every case. But also, you know, it's not in no cases at all. There are cases when it can happen. Death is not the only situation that makes remarriage possible. It should be understand, it should be very rare. And don't forget that the punishment that God imposed, it's not the case that, oh, well, if my husband or wife goes and commits adultery, then I'm free to get married, and that's, all, you know, that's, that's fine, that breaks the marriage. I mean, bear in mind that in, in the Old Testament times, the penalty, the penalty that was imposed on adultery was death. Which would make, well, guess what? Then <laughs> That would actually line up really well, because guess what? They commit adultery, they get put to death, and then, well, you're free to marry, etc. 
Now, we live in a world where that penalty is not imposed. But don't forget that that's what the law should be. It's not the case in our country, but Leviticus 20 verse 10 still says, The man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbour's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It doesn't say maybe, they shall surely be put to death. Um, what else is to finish with? Um, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty. She's free to be married to whom she will. So understand, you can choose who you marry. You can choose who you marry. But it says only in the Lord. If a believer does get remarried, they should be remarried to a believer. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Last verse. Verse number 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also I had the Spirit of God. So Paul's judgment, once again, if you've seen throughout this chapter, people will be happier if they remain unmarried. He does have the Spirit of God. That means that what he says is true. When you don't get married, guess what? That spares you plenty of pain. Plenty of pain and suffering. And don't get the idea of saying <laughs> marriage is all pain and suffering. But look, there are great benefits to being married. There are great benefits to being married. Proverbs 18.22 says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favour of the Lord. You know? It's one of the happiest days of my life, the day we got married. I remember when my wife came down the aisle. She came down the aisle singing. Oh, look, she's... She came down the aisle singing. Now that was surprising. That took me by surprise. I never expected that. Would you believe it? I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, what's she singing? My goodness me. Anyway, I won't say what I was doing. But anyway, we'll keep that secret. Let's finish up. So what we've seen in this chapter, all the, all the bases have been covered. All the bases have been covered in this chapter. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're widowed, remarried, all that sort of stuff. And the emphasis in this chapter is that it's absolutely fine even preferable in some cases to be single. Because as we've seen, being married is a big commitment. It's a big commitment to be married. It's a big com- Because guess what? You should be attempting to please your spouse. Whether you're a husband or whether you're a wife. In both cases. What that means is you need to find out what is your wife like? You need to do some of that. What is your wife not like? You need to stop. If your wife says, look, I really don't like when you do X, Y, or Z, then you think, okay, maybe that's something I should stop doing. And guess what? If your husband likes this and doesn't like that, well, guess what? That's what you should be doing. We're supposed to be pleasing one another. We're supposed to be, you know. And so think about getting married. When you, when you, if you're going to get married, realize that it's a big commitment, that it's a big commitment. Whether you get married or not, you know, it's completely up to you. Who you marry, that also is completely up to you. It's a good idea to choose carefully. Because once again, God hates divorce. God hates divorce. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And of course, obviously, the the whole thing that we started this chapter off, fornication. That's one of the big things about marriage, is to avoid fornication. We should flee fornication. Back in chapter number 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. He had nothing to do with it. Right through the Bible we see that. Look back at um, Proverbs chapter number Proverbs chapter number 5 and verse number 8. Proverbs chapter number 5 and verse number 8 it talks about the, the strange woman. And What you're supposed to do is get away from it. Look at Proverbs chapter number 5 and verse number 8. It says, Remove thy way far from her. Come not nigh the door of her house. Stay away. From that strange woman. Chapter number 7, verse number 5. At the window of my house, I looked through my casement. I beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths. A young man, void of understanding. What is he? He's foolish. He's stupid. Passing, what does he do? Through the street, near her corner. He went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. He should have kept away. You know, it says avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help each one of us to be content in whatever state we're in, whether it's married, whether it's single, and to realise, Lord, that, you know, you can work things out the way that you want them to be worked out. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. We want to have a good life. We want to enjoy ourselves. What we need to focus on is serving God. 
We need to focus on being good people, people who love you, Lord. We thank you for the blessing of marriage. We thank you for life itself. And we thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.